Good evening. The song before the prayer tonight will be number 461. 461. Father, thank you so much for this wonderful day. Dear Father, thank you for all the many blessings that you give us. Dear Father, thank you so much that we are able to come out this in the middle of the week to come and study another portion of thy word. Dear Father, please be with Brother Kozart that tonight what he has to say is what we need. And dear Father, please be with him as he studies hard and brings a message to us tonight. Dear Father, please be with the ones that are at camp. Help them to have a good week. And dear Father, hopefully someone there will obey your word this week. Dear Father, please be with the ones that aren't here due to sickness or whatever else might be. And please be with them, comfort them, and bring them back the next appointed time. Dear Father, thank you so much for loving us the way that you do and for all the many blessings that you give us. And dear Father, guide, guard, and direct us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Good evening, good evening, good evening. Hope everyone here tonight is nice and cool now that we're in the cool building. It's been a hot day today, but at least we've been looking forward to this event for Bible study this evening. For those who are visiting with us, we're certainly glad you've decided to be here. We do have a few, as we usually do, and we would invite you back at every opportunity you have to be with us. We'll dismiss the teachers up through elementary school to go to class at this time. continue our summer series this evening. We're very pleased to have with us Brother Adam Kozort, who hails originally, he tells us, from East Kentucky. He is the son of a preacher, so I asked him where he was from. He said, I'm a son of a preacher. And I said, okay, that's good enough. <laughs> but we're so glad to have him with us. He was formerly from the Milledgeville, Georgia congregation, where Justin Reeves knew him when he was in school. He has just now taken up the work at a congregation in Belmont, Mississippi. He's only been there for about a week or so. He said things are going great. So we're very pleased to have Brother Adam Kozort with us. He will continue our series, uh, this summer series, concerning the 13 betters in the book of Hebrews. We're very glad to have him with us. Brother Adam, come and speak to us at this time. Good evening. Please open your Bibles with me tonight, if you would, to Hebrews chapter 7. Hebrews chapter 7 is going to be a portion of what we will be using as our text this evening. Let me say while you're turning there that I appreciate so much the opportunity that has been extended to me by the elders and by Brother White to come and to be here with you uh, this evening. been looking forward to this for some time. But I tell you what, after moving and spending the last three weeks trying to focus on that, I, I'm about tired of traveling. <laughs> and so I appreciate so much the opportunity to be here. It is certainly a pleasure and I consider it an honor uh, to have the opportunity to meet uh, so many of you this evening and hope that you are looking forward to our study tonight. Our topic this evening is that of a better hope. The text that was given to me for this particular topic comes out of Hebrews chapter 7. As a matter of fact, the specific verse in chapter 7 is Hebrews chapter 7 verse 19, which reads, For the law made nothing perfect, but the bringing in of a better hope did, by the which we draw nigh unto God. This evening we want to consider what it means to have a better hope. Now, the book of Hebrews, as I'm sure has already been discussed multiple times up to this point, the book of Hebrews has as its theme how the new law is better than the old, how the New Testament, the new covenant is better than the old, and the things that pertain to the evidence that the writer of the book of Hebrews is giving to show and to prove to these Jewish Christians that you don't need to go back under what you were under. The old law won't work anymore. It's been nailed to the cross. It's been done away with. The things that pertain to that law aren't worth anything any longer. Their purpose has been fulfilled. The reason for their existence has been completed. In chapters 6 and 7 of the book of Hebrews, the Hebrews writer is focusing on for the most part, one topic. And that is the level of hope that we have under Christ as compared to the level of hope that was available under the old law. But what are we talking about when we talk about hope? You see, when you and I generally discuss hope in our everyday conversation, what do we generally use it? In what sense do we generally use it? 
Generally speaking, we talk about that we hope a certain thing happens. We hope that we get a certain result out of a certain level of effort. Or we hope that if this happens and if this happens, this is going to come about. Generally, when we use the term hope, is it not in the sense that we wish for a certain result? We wish that these things will come to pass. And yet, it's not necessarily with any level of confidence that that is the way things are going to be. We equate hope to a wishing system. And many times, that's the way people view the biblical aspects of hope. They look at the biblical nature of hope as being nothing more than hoping, wishing, desiring something to be the case, desiring for some effect, whether there's really any evidence that that effect's going to be there or not. It is that element that, as we might call it, of blind faith that says, I don't really have any evidence for what I believe or for what I practice. I just think that's the way it's supposed to be. That's the way most people view hope, is it not? I wish, I hope, I think this might be the result. But you see, that's not what the Bible talks about when it talks about hope. The word here that is used in Hebrews chapter 7 and in verse 19 and in over 90% of the other places in the New Testament where the word hope is used is the Greek word elpis. And it means literally, as defined by Strong, expectation or in the sense that we're going to use it tonight, confidence. You see, biblical hope is not a matter of wishing for a certain effect. It is, an, it is a matter of having confidence that if these things are accomplished, this will be the effect. There's a major difference between those two mentalities. And we're going to show the distinctions of those mentalities tonight in our discussion. But if hope means expectation or confidence as it is used here in Hebrews chapter 7 and in verse 19. And the Hebrews writer says that the law, speaking of the old law, made nothing perfect but the bringing in of a better hope, of a better confidence, of a better expectation did. What's he talking about? What brings in a better confidence? What gives us the ability to have more confidence now than they could have then? I would submit to you this evening that in the statements that are made in chapters 6 and 7, the Hebrews writer enumerates three different ways that we have a better hope, that we have a better confidence, that we have a better expectation of outcome under Christ than was possible under the old law. Consider with me, if you would, these three examples. Because... In order to really get the impact of what he's saying here in verse 19, we have to go all the way back to the middle of chapter 6. When you turn back in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 6 and you begin in verse number 10, argument number one that the Hebrews writer makes, and if I slip and I say the Apostle Paul, it's because I believe Paul's the one who wrote the book of Hebrews. If you don't believe that, you're welcome to your opinion. But if I let it slip, that's the reason for it. In Hebrews chapter 6, beginning in verse 10, the Hebrews writer states, first of all, that one of the ways by which we have a better hope is we have a better hope of full assurance. Notice what he says, beginning in verse 10. He says, For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love which ye have showed toward his name, in that ye have ministered to the saints and do minister. And we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end, that ye be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. For when God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself, saying, Surely blessing I will bless thee, and multiplying I will multiply thee. And so, after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. For men verily swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife. Wherein God, willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath. That by two immutable things, in which it was impossible for God to lie, 
we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil. I want you to notice what he says in these verses. He says, first of all, in verses 10 through 12, God does not forget those who work for Him. God does not forget those who have spent their lives and who use their lives in service to Him. Isn't that exactly what he says in verse 10? He says, God is not unrighteous to forget your work and your labor of love, which you've showed toward His name and ye have ministered to the saints and do minister. He says, God's not going to forget what you've done for Him. God's not going to forget what you've done for His people. God's not like that. God's not one of those individuals who uses you and then forgets about you. So what, are we, what is our desire? He says our desire, verse 11, is that every one of you show the same diligence, continue doing the same things that you have been doing, continue working the same way that you have been working, show the same diligence of the full assurance of hope to the end. There's something that is full, there's something that is complete about the assurance that we have under the covenant of Christ. What is it? In what way do we have complete assurance in God? He then gives an example of the complete assurance that we can have in Christ. Because beginning in verse 13 and going down through verse 17, he gives the example of God and Abraham. You see, he's going to give an example from the Old Testament of the, the way that the expectations, the way that the confidence had to be borne out. How did that happen? God made Abraham a promise. Verses 13 and 14. We read about the promise in Genesis chapter 12 and in Genesis chapter 15 and in other places where he talks about blessing, I will bless thee, and multiplying, I will multiply thee. And that's just a portion of the promise. But certainly it is a measure of the promise. But what is God talking about when he gives Abraham that promise? Is he talking necessarily about things that Abraham is going to see in his lifetime? Is he talking about things that are going to be readily and completely fulfilled by the time Abraham dies? No. You see, the promises that he's making, yes, Abraham was blessed. Yes, Abraham was multiplied. But the true measure of those things was not seen until long after Abraham's death with the coming of the Israelite nation. When he promises that through Abraham will all the families of the earth be blessed, was that fulfilled in Abraham's lifetime? No. That wasn't fulfilled until the coming of the Christ. You see, God made promises to Abraham. But Abraham wasn't going to live long enough to see the full assurance, the full confidence that those things were going to be fulfilled. So what did God do? According to verse 13, it says, When God made promise to Abraham because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself. And verse 15 says, And so after he had patiently endured he, uh, endured, he obtained the promise. For men verily swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife, wherein God willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath. God made a promise to Abraham. And he made that promise in this manner. He said, I am going to do this for you and for your descendants. And in fact, for all the families of the earth. And I promise you, based upon who I am. I am God. And I promise you, I'm going to do this. Did Abraham see the full completion of everything that God said to him? No. Did he have confidence in God that he would do what he said? Absolutely. He had hope in the promises of God. And somebody says, well, wait a second. We talk about what a great man of faith Abraham was. And absolutely, that is the case. Then how can you say, Adam, that we have a better hope, that we can have more confidence than what Abraham had? 
Notice what he says. Verse 17 again. He says, wherein God. Why did God seal that covenant, seal that promise with an oath? Did he do it for Abraham? Not according to Hebrews chapter 6. He says, wherein God, willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath. The oath was given not for Abraham. He knew that Abraham believed him. The oath was given for those who would come later, for the heirs of the promise, the ones who would come after Abraham. He goes even further in verse 18, and he says that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, who? We might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope, same word, set before us. God promised Abraham that he would do all that he said. And he sealed it with a matter of fact, with a matter of statement, that this is going to come to pass because of who he is. But why was it recorded? Why was it laid out? Why was it laid forth in the manner that we see it? In the manner that we have it? Was it for Abraham? No. It was for us. It was so that we could know, so that we could understand, and so that there would be no conflict within us as to who God was and how He dealt with man. That when God made a promise, when God said He was going to do something, you could mark it down, triple exit, underline in red, do whatever it is you wanted to do with it, that that was exactly what He was going to do. Evidence. We often quote Romans chapter 15, verse 4, where we quote Paul as having written, for whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning. And then we stop right there. But to what end? Why were the things which were written aforetime, which, by the way, Paul is stating the old law, he's referencing that, why were the things that were written aforetime written for our learning that we through the patience and comfort of the scriptures might have what? Hope. What hope do we gain from the things that were written aforetime? What hope do we gain from the learning of the things that have happened in the past? What confidence can be gleaned from those things? The promise of Abraham is one of the greatest and most valid evidences of the confidence that we can have in God. When God says he's going to do something, he does it. Now how does that translate to us? When God says, if you hear my word, if you obey my word, if you live after my commandments, and if you live your life for me, I will give to you a crown of life. I will lay before you eternal life in heaven with me for all eternity. What confidence do we have that God will do what he said he was going to do? We have the level of confidence that we can have in seeing that time after time after time after time, as you turn the pages of God's word, he does exactly what he said he was going to do, exactly the way he said he was going to do it. You see, verse 18 talks about that by two immutable things. What does the word immutable mean? The word immutable comes from a Greek word which literally means to be fixed, to be inalterable. You see, there are two things about God that do not change. His promise and His oath. When God says He's going to do something, He's going to do it. It's fixed. It's inalterable. Unless He gives a qualifier to it. In such cases as with Jonah and the city of Nineveh. Where He said, I'm going to destroy 
this city in 40 days unless you repent. You see, when God makes a promise, it's fixed. It's unalterable. It's not going to change. And when God makes a promise and He seals it with who He is, He's not going to allow anything to stand in the way of that. Question, by what is our covenant with God sealed? The blood of His Son. Is there any more solemn vow of who God is and what God is willing to do for man than the giving of the blood of the Son of God for our behalf? He's made us a promise. And He's sealed it with the blood of Christ. If we cannot have comfort and solace and patience and confidence and in the true biblical sense, hope in that, is there anything in which we can have confidence? You see, we have a better hope because we have a, a full assurance of the promises of God. They're complete because we see the completion of the promises that God has made in the past. In the second place, we have a better hope, not just because of the full assurance that we gain by the things that God has given us previously, but we have a better hope because we have a better high priest. Beginning in chapter 6 and in verse 20. And going down through chapter 7, verse 18, the Hebrews writer will deal with the priesthood of Christ. He says in chapter 6, beginning in verse 20, Whither the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus made an high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being by interpretation king of righteousness, and after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace, without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth a priest continually." Now consider how great this man was, unto whom even the patriarch Abraham gave the tenth of the spoils. And verily, they that are of the sons of Levi, who receive the office of the priesthood, have a commandment to take tithes of the people according to the law, that is, of their brethren, though they come out of the loins of Abraham. But he whose descent is not counted from them received tithes of Abraham, and blessed him that had the promises. And without all contradiction, the less is blessed of the better." And here men that die receive tithes, but there he receiveth them of whom it is witness that he liveth. And as I may so say, Levi also who receiveth tithes paid tithes in Abraham. For he was yet in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. If therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should, after, should rise after the order of Melchizedek and not be sealed after the order of Aaron? For the priesthood being changed, there is made of necessity a change also of the law. For he of whom these things are spoken pertaineth to another tribe, of which no man gave attendance at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah, of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning the priesthood. And it is yet far more evident, for that after the similitude of Melchizedek there ariseth another priest, who is made not after the law of a carnal commandment, but after the power of an endless life. For he testifieth, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. For there is verily a disannulling of the commandment going before for the weakness and unprofitableness thereof. In this particular passage, the Hebrews writer states that we have a better hope than those under the old law because we have a better high priest. You see, our high priest is not of Levi. Our high priest is not descended from Aaron. Our high priest is after a different order. He's after a different type of priest. He is a priest after the order of Melchizedek. Now people have tried to read all kinds of things into the first four verses of Hebrews chapter 7. But notice what the emphasis is about this particular statement. He says that this Melchizedek was one to whom Abraham 
gave tithes. We read about that in the book of Genesis, chapter 14, and the things that pertain to that particular event. That being said, he was a king who was a priest. He was first a king of righteousness, speaking of his high priesthood, and then the king of a city, the king of Salem, or as it was known, the king of peace. It is after this manner that Jesus is our high priest. He was described in verse 3, being, meaning Melchizedek, <coughs> as being without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth a priest continually. And somebody says, wait, 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 wait. Melchizedek didn't have a mom and a dad? No, that's not what he's saying. What he's saying is it didn't matter who his father and mother were. It didn't matter what his lineage was. You see, under the law of Moses, in order to be a priest, and especially the high priest, you not only had to be of the tribe of Levi, you had to be from the family of Aaron, and you had to be able to prove by lineage, without a shadow of a doubt, that you descended directly from Aaron. No such requirement with Christ. Why? Not under the same law. There's a new law in place. And under that new law, it doesn't matter who your parents were. It didn't matter who, whose lineage Christ was from, <coughs> from the standpoint excuse me, of his ability to be high priest. And yet Abraham recognized Melchizedek even though there was no lineage factor involved as to why he should recognize him. In the same manner, Christ is our high priest, but not because of any kind of physical attribution about who he was. It didn't matter who his parents were. It didn't matter who any of these other things belonged to or were, were responsible for or anything of that nature. What mattered is who he was and what he did. You see, we have a better high priest because we have a high priest that is not based upon, that is not focused on who their parents were. Notice what he says in verse 8 of chapter 7. He says, and here, meaning on this earth, in regard to the law of Moses, here men that die receive tithes, but there he receiveth them of one of whom it is witnessed that he liveth. You see, there is no perfection under the law of Moses. Under the law of Moses, those things which are given are given to just another man who holds the office because of who his family is. Nothing special about him. Nothing different about him. He's going to live and he's going to die just like everybody else. Who do we give to under the new covenant? Who do we give of our time and of our love and of our efforts and of our blessings? To whom do we give? To one who's just like us, who's received that office based upon who he is or who his parents were? No. We have a high priest of whom it is witnessed, verse 8, that he liveth. That term liveth comes from the Greek word which means literally lives and will continue living. No end. Priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Why? Because, verse 11, the Hebrews writer says, If therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should rise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron? He says if everything was perfect, if everything was just right with the Levitical priesthood, what need would there have been for somebody else? But there was a need for somebody else. There was no perfection and thus no hope, no confidence, nothing to which one could attach themselves under the law of Moses. What hope was there that could be gained from the priesthood or from the high priest under the law of Moses? The only confidence that you had 
was that next year or next week or next month or tomorrow, you could come back and offer the same sacrifices for the same sins and continue to roll them forward year after year after year. There was nothing made perfect or complete under the law of Moses, and the people who lived under the law recognized that. It was given to them with that understanding. It wasn't perfect. Now the law has changed. He says, beginning in verse 12, For the priesthood being changed, there is made of necessity a change also of the law, because under the old law, could Christ have been a priest, much less the high priest? Absolutely not. He was of the wrong tribe. He was of the wrong family. He had the wrong parents. All of these things were wrong. But not under the old law anymore. The new law is in effect. And under the new law, it doesn't matter about one's parents. A person's status as a priest under the new law is not based upon who their family is. It's not based upon the amount of money that they have. It's not based upon anything of that nature. What's it based upon? Who are the priests under the new covenant? Does not John state in, in Revelation chapter 1 and in verse 8 that we are all priests? You see, priesthood under the new covenant does not depend on physical genealogy. It depends solely upon if we are willing to serve. Are we willing to be obedient? Are we ones who are going to give ourselves over to the service of the Master, God? And our high priest is one who gave himself over to the ultimate service, did he not? in giving himself for us. The ultimate example. A better high priest. See, Christ is not a high priest after the form of the Levites. Therefore, we have a better hope. In Hebrews chapter 8, Beginning in verse 1, the Hebrews writer will continue these statements by saying this. He says, Now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle which the Lord pitched and not men. For every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices, wherefore it is of necessity that this man have somewhat also to offer. For if he were on earth, he should not be a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law, who serve under the example and shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to, take, to make the tabernacle. For see, saith he, that thou shalt make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. But now, but now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry, by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, was established upon better promises and I promise I'm not going to deal with all of the things that are involved in those because I believe some others later on will be dealing with that we have a better hope we have better confidence we have a better expectation of effect because we have a better high priest we have a high priest that is there based not upon a physical standard but based upon the spiritual nature of heaven. Finally, this evening, in our last few moments, we have a better hope because we have full assurance. We have a better hope because we have a better high priest. But finally, going back once again to verse 19 of Hebrews chapter 7, the place where we started this evening, notice how he concludes the thought. We have a better hope of perfection. Notice what he says. For the law, the Old Testament, the Old Covenant made nothing perfect. Didn't complete anything. Did it pave the way for those things which were to come? Absolutely. Did it set in order the things which God needed to be set in order in order for the Messiah to come on the scene? Absolutely. Did it fulfill its purpose to the fullest degree? You better believe it. But did it complete anything? No. The law 
made perfect, or made nothing perfect. But the bringing of a better hope did. You see, when Christ came, and He died on the cross, and He was raised from the dead, and He ascended back to the Father and established the kingdom, and all of those things took place, the effect was perfection. The effect was completion. The effect was a better, a more solid, a more able confidence that all of the things that God said He was going to do he did. And all of the things which He promised to do in the future will be done. Because He had proven them. Not just by His promises, but by the fulfillment of prophecy after prophecy after prophecy. By the fulfillment of everything that had been promised pertaining to the Christ. By the establishment of all things pertaining to the church that had been laid into effect so that we could have full and complete and utter confidence that all that God said was true. The law made nothing perfect. But the bringing of a better hope did. And what did that better hope make available to us? Notice what he says at the end of verse 19. By the which? By what? The law? No. By that better hope, we draw nigh to God. Why is the new law better than the old? It gives us a better hope. Because it gives us a hope that is full of assurance. It gives us a confidence to a level that could never have been attained under the old law. We have a better hope because we have a better high priest. We have a high priest that isn't bound to this physical world as the standard by which he reigns and exists. We have a better hope because we have in our grasp through the Word of God, completion, perfection, all things fulfilled. Under the law of Christ, we have a better hope. We have the confidence of full salvation. Under the old law, such did not exist. Yes, you could roll them forward from year to year, but there could be no remission. There could be no remittance of sins. Under the new law, those sins are washed away. And God says their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. As if they never happened. What kind of confidence does that give? What kind of confidence does that bring to us. As we close this evening, let me remind you once again of Hebrews chapter 16, verse 19, which we talked about earlier this evening, but not in full. Notice what he says. He says, Which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil. You see, the biblical nature of hope is not wishful thinking. It's not that proverbial throwing of the penny into the wishing well and hope that what you wished for comes true. It's confidence. It is understanding who God is, what God has done, and what He has said He will do. And that confidence if properly applied, will anchor us to God so surely and so steadfastly that there is nothing this side of eternity that can tear us away from it. Where is our hope? Where is our confidence? 
Is it placed in God? Is it placed in His Word or is it placed in ourselves? And therefore, because our confidence is placed in ourselves, we say, I hope this is going to be the result. Or can we instead look out and say, I have the ultimate hope that this will be the result without any fear of contradiction, without any fear of failure on God's part, having full, complete, and ultimate confidence. We should be able to say that. We've off, I've, well, I've heard, I don't know whether you have or not. Maybe you've felt this way before. Those who have stated, you know, I've done the best that I can. I have striven with all that I have to do what God has commanded, but I'm just not sure if I died right now, I'd go to heaven. And friends, somewhere along the way, we've not delivered biblical hope. Because biblical hope delivers the confidence that says, I know if I continue to do what God would have me to do, I know where I'll be when I die. God expects us to have that level of confidence. However, with that level of confidence available and with all that has been given to us comes a greater level of responsibility, does it not? To hold on to those things. To make sure that we know and that we understand and that we follow through with what has been made available to us and that we ever live as ones who have full hope. Thank you for your time this evening.